but somewhere where I would, okay, if I can bring this in house, I could park here. By using a straight line angle, I can take three measurements around. From Studio 4 in beautiful Naperville, Illinois, Spinezi Interactive Channel continues with ADAS, Calibrations and Scanning. Now your host, COO of Spinezi Americas, Mr. Tim Morgan. Welcome back to our interactive channel, uh, and, and i got a pretty uh, awesome guest with us today, um, Chuck Olson from AirPro Diagnost Diagnostics. Um, Chuck and I have served on several committees together, uh, worked uh, through... Um, the board of directors at Equipment Tool Institute. We've uh, even have a upcoming speaking engagement together at uh, at uh, a national trade show. So um, one of the things we see are a lot of misconceptions of what's happening with ADAS. What do I need in the shop to be able to facilitate the repair? What needs to be done to the vehicle before? A calibration can happen or scanning so I thought we would uh, try to dive into that uh, Chuck of um, um, getting some of the straight answers for uh, the people who follow the interactive channel yeah well uh, thanks for having me that's uh, uh, happy to be here and and there there is a you know just like you and I had spoken about over the years that uh, if you're in the auto repair business, you're in the collision repair business. And uh, six, seven years ago, I didn't believe that, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember starting up my presentations about six, seven years ago and saying, sit back down, everyone, because if you're in the auto business, you are in the collision business. And if you think about it, um, average shop out there today is probably not equipped. Uh, correctly to be able to handle all the ADAS things that are out there. Um, are they equipped for scanning? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But when you start to look at where the vehicle has progressed over the past, uh, say, 24 months, there's been a lot of changes in the industry. Um, and it's something that every shop is going to have to be aware of, whether they're doing the repair in-house or they're sending it out to an automotive shop. I hear stories that even sometimes when a vehicle is sent to the dealership that the dealership's not even equipped to be able to ready to be able to reset those systems after a collision so uh carl you got a question do you want us to start with yeah so let's start off with chuck um you hear you hear a lot of people talk about adas okay but what is adas for those that don't deal with it every day or even those that do deal with it every day what is adas and why is it important yeah, so what uh, ADAS, as the acronym stands for, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. So these are systems to assist the driver and, you know, after some years of research to reduce accidents, reduce severity, and most important, uh, to reduce injuries and save lives is what these systems are for. And uh, uh, some of these systems have been around for quite some time. Ultrasonic sensors have been around for almost 20 years for park assist. Uh, the first uh, uh, systems for adaptive cruise, cruise control, 2004, with radar adaptive cruise control, uh, the early versions. Uh, but as time has gone on and the uh, computing power has gotten much better in the vehicles to be able to fuse these systems together or work together, now we've got automatic emergency braking, we've got you know lane keep assist uh, using these different technologies, and... Uh, now drivers are starting to rely on them and the statistics prove that they are reducing accidents and reducing the severity of accidents and uh, and saving lives and as time goes on with newer younger drivers I'll use my kids as an example it uh, they don't even look over their shoulder when they back the vehicle back up and it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it kind, kind, kind of drives me crazy but you know we, we do have new younger drivers that are relying on these systems on these vehicles and it's more important than ever as we're making these repairs that uh, to the vehicles that, look, that affect the system, and most importantly, that we make sure that they're working properly uh, when it's returned back to the customer. So, what kind of what kind of systems are we seeing right now? What what? And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the Bugatti that's walking through the door. I'm talking about the mom and pop station wagon, so to speak. Now, what what are we seeing? 
Yeah, the, the the most common systems that we have in the uh, in the vehicles now are lane keep assist or uh, uh, lane keep assist warning. Uh, you know, there's different levels of that, and uh, blind spot monitoring, and uh, and is what's coming up right right now is uh, automatic emergency braking by fusing these uh, systems together. So even the ultrasonic sensors are now going to be feeding into automatic emergency braking in low speed situations. And uh, <clears throat> probably one of the newest ones that we're going to see that's uh, being re reintroduced. It was it was popular uh, probably early 2000s. Is the uh, the night vision uh, uh, displays on the vehicles, and that's coming back into play because that's one of the areas that automatic emergency braking struggles in is in low light situations. Uh, so what uh, with that system, the uh, <clears throat> shoot, I can't remember what. Uh, uh, what it's called, it's a, a heat-sensitive system that uh, that picks up the images uh, for, for night vision. And then, of course, we're going to start seeing LIDAR come into play. Uh, so later on, as the cost of those things come down. So uh, heat sensing would be like a FLIR type of forward imaging? Yes. Forward-looking mm -hmm. imaging? Okay. With, and with these cars, and, and you say these are mom-and-pop cars, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with, with these cars... What are we, what's a shop to do with these cars? I mean, first off, how do I even know what is on this car when it rolls in my shop? Yeah, so there, you got to use several different uh, uh, of layers of inspection, uh, looking at the vehicle, inspecting the vehicle, and understanding what these systems are. So we got two different pieces. We've got the features of what it does, like can't lane keep assist or uh, automatic cruise control or the names. That's what it does. But the things we need to identify is the the sensors that input into these systems. So it's what creates the new features is the technology, is the programming, is the higher level of computing power. But we're still using cameras, radars, ultrasonic sensors as the inputs. So being able to identify those and, and looking at the vehicles, uh, uh, there is a mis misconception that a VIN decoder will tell you what's on the vehicle. So it's going to tell you what the options are, but it's not going to tell you the option content of that vehicle. So you're going to have to look that vehicle over and understand what those uh, what systems are on that before you even start in the repair process. And the other level that you can uh, collect that data off the vehicle is when you scan it, the scan tool is going to show you the systems of what they responded. But you still have to know what's on it because if scan tool doesn't respond to a system, you need to know is that system broken or is that system not on the vehicle. Well, and, and then the other question is, is <laughs> if the system's on the vehicle, um, it's my understanding that you can actually turn on and off those systems remotely um, now. So uh, are, we looking, are we looking at systems that are enabled and, or not enabled, and are they installed or not installed? Yeah, so installed or not installed, is uh, uh, that's going to be, be one thing, and, and they're are with some of the uh, manufacturers that you can program updates and turn some of these uh, systems on. Uh, and there's talk about some of these systems, different features on the vehicle being ongoing subscriptions that you subscribe to, like uh, automatic cruise control or adaptive cruise control. Uh, but uh, my opinion is these things go forward and the life-saving capabilities of these and as they become mandated safety equipment, that they're going to be on all the time, which is going to make it much more important that when the vehicle leaves the shop, we are sure that the system is working properly. Well, and it seems to me that uh, the shop today has to have some type of um, system or way to be able to get to the OEM procedures. Yeah. Um, and especially to be able to identify what's on the vehicle so that you can log in by VIN, figure out exactly what was in the build of that car to know where to be able to actually even start the repair. Um, and to your point, it starts with its first scan to yeah. find out where where you are in that position before you even start the repair. Yeah, yeah. scan and, uh, and, and the close visual inspection. And uh, also getting the data, you know, from the OEM and from the VIN number. I mean, the, the whole concept of blockchain has been around for quite some time. But for that VIN number of a birth date, uh, this is what this vehicle has. So that will make it much easier for the repairers to identify the systems on these vehicles than what we have today. So identification is one thing. 
Okay. Then we have all of the things that we're looking for in, in terms of what we need to be looking at on the repair. And I'm not talking about the structural side. I'm just talking about the electronic side. So let's talk about the structural side. And I want to toss this over to Tim. From a structural standpoint, how important is it when we do our scans that the structure will be okay because I can put the sensor back however I want, right? Well, one of the things that we're finding today in the industry is that it is very important to put the sensor back where it belongs. That's why you'll find that in our database that we are adding those points as actual structural measuring points on the car so that we can make sure that if the sensor um, was damaged or needs to be replaced, putting a quarter panel on, is the panel back where it's supposed to be in a correct position, XYZ, three-dimensional measurement to make sure that um, the sensor is going to be active and activate the proper way because if it's not put back in the same original position, it's not going to work correctly. Um, and you can reset a code and have something not put structurally sound back in the right position and it, your code may reset, but that doesn't mean that it's going to operate the same way. Um, should another event happen that that sensor needs to operate. Um, secondly, if you look at just about every um, ADAS repair procedure that's out there, it's starting from a center line. Um, and it's also looking at the thrust angle of the wheel alignment and the toe. So we need to make sure that we have a wheel alignment. But more importantly, if that vehicle is not square, uh, if that structure is not square, we can't really do any of the rest of it. You're not going to be able to get your wheel alignment correctly. You're not going to be able to get um, everything set correctly without having a square vehicle. So to the point of passing this vehicle off to, say, Chuck, the technician, to turn around and perform the calibration, we need to hand off to him a vehicle that is structurally correct, um, and it has proper wheel alignment before he can proceed. So, Chuck, as we were speaking this morning when we were out getting some training on on how to be able to calibrate and some of the, the newer tools that are out there and some of the, the innovative things that are happening in the future, um, you mentioned shop-ready, vehicle-ready. You right. want to go into detail about that? Yeah, so what, uh, and, and, you know, and there is two different elements, but it's being, you know, ADAS ready and ADAS capable. So what, uh, so from, from the shop's perspective, being ADAS ready, your shop may not be actually performing ADAS calibrations, but you got to make sure that it's ready. And all the points that you brought up, that the center line is correct, that the vehicle is straight, that the things have been put on the, uh, the vehicle in the right position. When it is, and it does go off to calibration, that calibration is going to be successful because the car is straight. Uh, you can waste a lot of time trying to calibrate a vehicle when you have a structural problem, and it's going to end up going back, and you just wasted a lot of time, you wasted a lot of money, and uh, you know you might end up with a vehicle that's total that should have been repaired to begin with if the measurements weren't done properly and the proper repair plan put in place based on, uh, based on the measurements. Uh, and that's the same thing with the car being being ready. So getting ready to repair the car, again, taking those measurements and understanding what's wrong, what needs to be straightened, is going to affect which calibrations that you need to identify. So you don't pull up on a scan tool. It doesn't tell you the system needs to be calibrated. You need to find that in the service information based on what you did to the vehicle. So, And that's why measuring is more important today than it ever has been. Okay, so we're going to measure the vehicle. We're going to make sure it has a wheel alignment. And then let's say, for instance, from what we were working with this morning, the vehicle needs a windshield. So a vehicle comes in for a windshield. You're still at that point even relying that the wheel alignment is correct or the vehicle was given to you. I guess the easier way to say is the vehicle was given to you to calibrate, assuming that the structure is straight, and the wheel alignment is correct? Yes, that, and that would be the assumption that uh, when you go into a calibration. And uh, that's going to be a challenging uh, uh, challenging area in the, uh, 
in the requirements of doing a calibration as a verification that the alignment is in specification. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean just because you replaced a windshield you need to align the vehicle, but you do need to verify that the vehicle is within specification of the alignment because that's a requirement for the calibration of the vehicle to behave properly after it's calibrated. So, so in effect, then, you're going to be adding more repair procedures or possibly checks along the way to be able to get to the, your point of calibration. Yes. And, and that's obviously with any vehicle that's out there. Yep. And, and another thing that came up, I noticed with my text today, is that your trainer said on certain vehicles, you're going to have to make sure it has a full tank of gas because that's how it was calibrated. Or on some wheel alignments, they ask for ballasts in certain sitting positions of certain vehicles when they're doing a wheel alignment. So all that stuff would also still pertain? Uh, yes, and, and uh, <clears throat> it would, but this is going to go come back to the service procedure. So it you can't put a blanket statement whenever you're going to do a calibration. You need to have it. It depends on which calibration you're doing. So you're going to have different requirements for a 360 view calibration or an ultrasonic, ultrasonic sensor check than you would for a forward-facing camera or forward-facing radar. So some of those procedures may require the full tank of gas where others will not. So you're always going to default to what the repair procedure is for the component that you're going to be calibrating. Okay, again, so it's showing the importance that I have to have repair procedures for every vehicle because different makes different models uh, and, and different processes that you're doing in calibration are going to require different methods that have to be done. Yep. Mm -hmm. depending on the system and, and it's different amongst manufacturers as well so <clears throat> and I've also heard some talk about you know with the full tank of gas of how the vehicle was set up before that uh, some procedures of adding weight whether it be sandbags or whatever the truck to simulate a gas tank for that so that the vehicle is sitting at the right level right height uh, when it's baseline for calibration is said that and that's usually for a forward-facing camera or forward-facing radar. And then the same thing would go for, say, your local sales guy that sells widgets, and he has a trunk full of widgets. Yeah. We'd have to make sure the, those widgets were out of there to make sure yeah. that we have the right ride of the vehicle mm -hmm. uh, or level of the vehicle to be yeah, able to do that calibration. Four sets of golf clubs need to come out. Yeah, four sets of golf clubs, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so so there is far more things to this than just saying, my shop, I have the tools and I'm going to calibrate. Right, right. It, uh, yeah, and, and again, that's being, you know, ADAS ready before you get to the before you get to the calibration and even in a repair situation so you have a repair situation different things have happened you do you know steering rack comes out or an electronic steering column has to come out or be dismounted now you've got a steering angle sensor calibration that needs to be done first uh, you have yaw rate sensors and uh, directional sensors that need to be reset first and you're talking about the sensor position i mean let's just go back before the adas stuff it's like I remember the guys, it's like, oh, this is damaged here. I'm just going to drill a hole over here and put the airbag sensor and move it over. You know, it's six inches. That's <laughs> yeah, you're not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but, I mean, I remember seeing that stuff. And now with the, uh, uh, with the level of ADAS, and we still got all the airbag systems, that they've all uh, evolved as well. So uh, uh, that, that precise positioning, again, is just, just very, very important, and, and it saves lives. So Chuck, when I attack a car, and I, and I and I call it an attack because we're going to come at it with our resources. Okay, what do I need to think of first as I bring it in, and I'm I'm starting to write my repair processes? And you say, well, you know, Carl, you just can't use a blanket statement. Okay, so what do I need? To, what is my checklist? Yeah, it's uh, who's paying the bill. No, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, it, you know, it's just got to be a good assessment of uh, of the damage on the vehicle. But uh, the pre scan pre scan information and uh, the pre measurement information, and then a list of what you know what is going to come on and off of that vehicle after your initial assessment, and then reviewing all the repair procedures. So as you're reviewing those repair procedures. Uh, if any of these sensors are coming off, you take something as simple as a grill. 
is going to call for a forward-facing radar calibration if the vehicle's equipped. So again, you know, equipment, damage, service information, scan tool information, and measurements. If you, you got to line all those things up before you even so that you know what you're going to do. Well, and and let's you and I were talking a little earlier today uh, about the let's just call them trucks in some states that uh, when you were driving down the road <laughs> they might be oh you know a bit taller than the rest of the trucks out there and and in in the newer trucks have as much as much ADAS on them as is any passenger vehicle or any luxury vehicle 10 years ago mm-hmm. um what are my concerns when I get one of those big tall modified trucks or even little squatty um little um car that's been modified by the teenagers what do i what do i need to worry about with those yeah and uh, i i think in the, in those situations that uh and it's usually pretty easy to spot a modified vehicle is uh to find some vehicle repair history and find some history on that vehicle because there are procedures with different manufacturers that you can account for a modification and reprogram modules or reprogram ride height or tire sizes to accommodate the ADAS system so they work properly. But if the person who did the modification didn't do that, it's now it's the owner's responsibility to get it done, not necessarily the repairer's responsibility. But that's kind of a dilemma for the repairer. Do I go forward and repair this vehicle that I know doesn't have these safety systems working properly and put it back on the road? Because it's not just the driver who is at, uh, who's at risk, it's everybody else on the road as well. So what, uh, there's kind of a, an ethical issue there. What do you do about that? Well, and I think I remember back to an industry meeting a couple years back where they had a, I, I, I want to say it was a Toyota pickup truck that um, had been modified by a modification company, changed the taillights, um, which caused codes because they weren't the factory taillights. All the sensors weren't in there for the radar system that it was supposed to have. It had aftermarket mirrors, which means that all of a sudden now the temperature sensor for the dash was not functioning correctly. The front bumper had been replaced and modified with a, uh, if you want to call it a cow catcher or something like that, um, which added to the weight of the vehicle, caused the vehicle to have a downward slope in the front, which changed the ride height. Um, and then it had modified tires and wheels and it had a lift kit. So there wasn't so much in this vehicle that had been changed that the average shop, when they pull this vehicle in and they start looking at the codes, is going to be scratching their head. Where do we go from here? Or is this a vehicle we can even really love correctly put back to, you know, to the OEM level that it was at with, uh, you know, with some of the adaptions that were made to the vehicle? So th- you bring up a you bring up a great point which is there's so much out there right now and you just can't assume you you, you know Chuck Chuck made a, a comment it's easy to modify it's easy to spot a, a custom vehicle but some of some of these customizations aren't as apparent right until until you start to, until you start to get into diagnostics yeah and and I worry I worry about that from a technician point of view. Yeah, and you know, and it's probably easy for me to say a lot of the colleagues that I work with, for us it's pretty easy to spot a modified vehicle. Uh, but you're right, there's a lot of technicians that may think that that's the way the vehicle came. Uh, but uh, there have been across uh, uh, multiple OEMs that they have accounted for ways that uh, you can adjust, like I said, the ride height, re under the ride height, reprogram some of the systems on these vehicles to account for the ADAS systems working properly. So I think that's going to be the most important piece if you have a vehicle that you suspect has been modified or if you're getting, you know, another reason to pre-scan. If you're seeing a lot of issues, that's going to tip you off that uh, the vehicle may have been modified as well. But now interview the owner. And, and get some history that be, was this system working before? Do you use this system? Has been, you know, don't may say, I, they may not even know that the, the, the car has those systems. It, uh, even with cars that haven't been modified, uh, uh, with a lot of our shop customers, uh, I've gotten feedback of how surprised they are that the owner doesn't even know their car has adaptive cruise control. They just don't use it. 
Yeah, and I think sometimes uh, when a p- person goes to a dealership and we see dealerships sending vehicles out to be customized or, or, or modified, and then you know put on the put on the lot for sale with the you know a markup value or or whatever or additional value, um, they because they're picking the car up at the dealership, they just sometimes assume that that's the way the car was manufactured. They're not realizing right. that the aftermarket styling and that thing was, those types of things were done. So when the vehicle is involved in a collision, they're just, again, assuming that it's this is the way it was right when I got it, when it very well may not have been. Mm-hmm. So I think that's I think you're you're right to the point of the scanning, knowing the information about the vehicle, and do we have to do uh, any resets or adjustments um, for reprogramming, which would not even be part of the exact collision effect. It's actually something previous to that right. where Pre-existing. you're going to have more labor operations there uh, and, and uh, reprogram timing to be able to correct that vehicle than you would in a, uh, you know, a standard diagnostic situation. Right, right. And, you know, and, and to that point as well, if, if a vehicle has been modified and the adjustments weren't made to uh, account for those modifications for these systems to work properly, it may not have shown up at the shop to be in with. True, true. You know, so if the, you had a vehicle that started out less than what it was supposed to be. So... With these cars, and, and I, I want to go back to a, a specific instance that I was witness to, and this was back in 2012, 2013. I was, I was at a facility, and this facility, we pulled a car right off the lot and said we're going to scan it, okay? Now, this was ready for delivery. When I mean right off the line, I mean right off the detail line, mm-hmm. okay? It was, just, it was just getting its bath, and the owner had been called. It was a um, 2012, and we did the scan on it, and we got 25 codes off of it, okay? Now, that's scary for me in terms of, in terms of what shops are delivering. What are some of the things that you've seen, Chuck, that um, specific, specific instances where this vehicle was was delivered had been delivered to the customer and brought back and was delivered with deficient codes systems uh probably one of the worst cases that i've seen is uh <clears throat> where an air- airbag system has been disabled so when uh and a vehicle comes in and it's been in a been in an accident and we get the vehicle and uh, i find all these airbag problems in scanning the vehicle or systems that aren't active and the shop says well the airbag light's not on well that's because it's been disabled and that that's probably the worst case scenario and uh, uh and i've seen it happen before it's uh uh people can hack their ways around a vehicle without airbags and make the airbag light turn off and that's pretty scary so in some of the situations you're talking about it's it's not uncommon uh, to see a vehicle that might go out with 20, 25 codes. It depends on what the codes are uh, that are in the vehicle because uh, we do see a uh, a lot of situations where a vehicle goes out that's had a uh, dead battery situation. So if the battery goes below a certain voltage, it's not uncommon for it to set 20, 25 codes in a vehicle if it's set. However, when that happens... Things like your yaw rate sensor normalization, those kind of things are going to take time. They won't relearn right away. So a lot of those systems won't react properly. But they're not necessarily detrimental, but they could be in a short term. So, I mean, there's a lot of gray area there. But the the uh, the best practice is to know what's in the vehicle and know that it's clear before you deliver it, rather than guessing your way through it. Well, in... From my experience of being in the shop also, I've seen vehicles that there was no light on the dash, but we still got codes. Yep. Yep. And uh, that's that's very common uh, as well with uh, a lot of these codes have, uh, you know, they'll go into a pending status or they'll have a two-trip or a three-trip failure, depending on what they are before a symptom shows up. And a, uh, a skilled diagnostic technician, it doesn't matter which tool you're using. I mean, you can have the greatest tool on earth, 
of uh, the OEM scan tool, the latest one out, if the technician is just going in and reading and clearing codes, he's not using the tool properly. So if a skilled technician will look at that data, look at those data streams, and already know that this system is pending a failure just based on the data and the data stream. So you can't rely on the light, and you really can't rely on, uh, on a lack of a trouble code as much as uh, you did before. I mean, you can disconnect and reconnect a battery and uh, make a light go off, but you didn't fix anything. Right, <laughs> exactly. Codes yeah. and, and clearing codes does not fix a car either. No, no, you're, you're correct there. And, and that's, I think that's one of the misconceptions, I think, in the industry is that um, we're going to use the scan tool just to clear the code. And it's like, wait a minute, the code was put there for some reason. Mm. We need to backtrack through the vehicle and find out what that is. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then there's uh, other trouble codes that uh, that there are in vehicles. There are times that a vehicle will be delivered with a trouble code, but this is an exception, and those are called permanent codes. So there's permanent codes that will be set in a co set in a vehicle. You clear the code, it changes status from an active code to a permanent code. The the name permanent is kind of a misconception, but that means that code's going to continue to display until it self-tests and runs a self-test two, three times, and then it will self-clear. So some manufacturers start to put them in. They're mostly for emissions, uh, but uh, if you don't know what a permanent code means, you could end up trying to fix a problem that doesn't need that to be doesn't fixed exist. Either. Okay. So it can go both ways. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing in the shop is... And I used to work for another company, and I used to be in the software end of it before I went to to work with Spinezy. Is technicians in the shop not necessarily computer guys? Okay, and I'm not saying not every and all. So don't you know? Don't be throwing stones at your screen right now. If you're a computer guy and you work in a shop, that's great. Um, but we have our share of technicians that aren't. And what I'm what I'm seeing is is we're headed towards computers and scan tools and electronics and so on. Is that a different technician? Is that a new role in this industry? It, uh, I think it is, and, and I think it's a growing role uh, that, uh, that we have in there now, and that's uh, one, of the, one of the main services that we provide now is the uh, managing the computer and the computer systems to be able to run the, all these different scan tools. So what, uh, there's a lot of technicians that would work on one brand that had a handheld scan tool and very proficient with that uh, with that single scan tool. But now they've gone to PC based with multiple vehicle communication interfaces. We have Windows 10 updating all the time. We have uh, antivirus software. This version needs to run Java, and this version needs to, to to run a different application in order to work. So just managing the software on the computer to be able to work on multiple cars is a challenge all by itself before you even get to diagnosing the car. So what, uh, and that is a uh, a growing role. So just like we've seen, collision mechanical part of the industry kind of converging in the, into the same area. You're going to say the same thing happened with computer sciences. Uh, of those people in that skill set realizing that automotive is high tech and uh, uh, there's an area of opportunity and their skills are going to be needed. Well, it, it, uh, that's what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm seeing a, a trend towards, well, I mean, let's, let's use manufacturer Tesla, which has done an incredible amount of electronics in their vehicle compared to a lot of a lot of OEMs to the point that Tesla has released, and, and they're doing they're doing software modifications, software upgrades mm -hmm. with existing hardware. So, are, is that a trend that we're going to start seeing? Uh, probably with uh, uh, with more electrification. Uh, d d yes, uh, and you know with the electrified vehicles like the Teslas, and you know we got the Luces and the Rivians and. Uh, more of them coming into play. We've got a lot less moving parts, so it's it is more software driven, and uh, being able to improve functionality of what's already on the vehicle, what you're already using, or being able to add a little bit of hardware, and then do some software upgrades in the operating system for it to improve is uh, is going to be an ongoing thing. And I think those vehicles are going to end up lasting a lot longer 
as long as the ADAS systems work and they don't crash. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think t- to your point, Carl, um, looking at this industry, it's becoming more and more high tech every day. There's more technical information being released every day, and we need to get more of that information out to the consumer so they understand when they drop their car off for a windshield. And if you notice, there's a couple of uh, windshield companies doing commercials now, um, and they're not just talking about the windshield being replaced. They're talking about, oh, I had to have my camera recalibrated. So they're they're sending early warnings, if you want to call it, to the consumer. But I think the consumer needs to be more educated uh, from the level of the dealership selling the vehicle or the information coming from the manufacturer so that the customer, the end user in the car, the consumer knows exactly what to expect when they bring their vehicle into the facility that I'm not just coming to get a windshield. I'm also coming to get some electronics taken care of or, you know, a calibration or, or whatnot um, that needs to be done in order to facilitate that repair. Um, and ultimately it's going to increase the cost of the repair it, um, because it's something that has to be done on the, uh, you know, as a safety standpoint, um, the customer needs to be able to get that car back at a, at a pre-loss condition. Um, and it needs to be able to function. So it's not just, is there a light on or do I, you know, a code somewhere or do I have to replace a sensor? There's a lot more that goes into it today. And I think we need to, uh, as a, a group of automotive uh, repair companies uh, all, all around, I think, trying to make the consumer understand more of what is, you know, what's under their hood, if you want to call it, or, you know, what's in, uh, you know, what's in their dash. Um, you mentioned earlier about steering columns. There's several vehicle manufacturers that says if the vehicle's involved in a collision and it's hitting the front, the steering column should come out and it should be measured. Right. Uh, to make sure it's dimensionally correct and it hasn't collapsed. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably can count a handful of shops that are even thinking about that part of the diagnostics of the vehicle. And again, we're going back to, is the vehicle calibration ready? Yep. Well, the other question I've got is, Chuck, and I know you haven't heard this one, but this, you know, the price of ADAS calibrations and scan, that's included in the cost of the repair, correct? (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's uh one one price we just do everything so right (laughs) you uh, sound like the guy writing the estimate yeah yeah. (laughs) well and and it's a very we laugh about it but it's a it's a very real scenario that happens every day in in the industry so what is your advice for a shop that has been what's your advice for a shop that knows they need to do scans and calibrations and they know that they're going to get beat up on it. It, uh, I would document every step of the way. And again, you know, the, the measurement, follow the process, the identification, the measurement, what I took on and off of that vehicle, what the service information says, and then also document all the procedures that you do step by step. So it, uh, and you brought up a, you know, a good point, one price, you know, fix it all, you know, not necessarily. You may have one vehicle that had a steering column out or uh, had some structural damage that requires three or four or five different calibrations to be done. And that's going to take more time, be a higher cost than a vehicle that had a grill replaced and only has one component calibrated. So you need to document case by case what you did. So if you did four by four calibrations on a vehicle and an alignment, those things need to be documented. They need to be compensated for fairly. But at the same time, you can't hit the insurer over the head and charge them, you know, a, uh, you know, an exorbitant amount every time you touch a car with a calibration. So there's got to be some give and take. So just documenting properly is the best advice I can give. And, and, that it, and this is nothing new. We should be documenting all of our repairs, every, everything that we're doing to the vehicle in order to make sure that we're, number one, we're following the OEM procedures. Right, group and mm-hmm. back to OEM specifications. But number two is if there's ever a question, and God forbid somebody end up in the court, um, we've got all of our printouts with a date on them and, and so on in a nice jacket. Right. And I'm assuming that we're going to include all of our scanning and ADAS calibration reports as well. 
Well, yeah. I mean, you can't skimp when it comes to safety. You could put a terrible paint job on the car and get away with it. I've seen them in traffic, to be honest. You can't tell me you haven't. Some of those silvers just don't match. <laughs> but there's no way you can skimp when it comes to safety. And there, there's, there's no way that um, a shop owner today or even a technician should put themselves in a position um, that could force them into a legal situation of I didn't do this part of the repair because my insurance partner said it wasn't necessary. Um, at that point, I believe that shop owner, manager, technician needs to explain the situation to the consumer that this has to be done. Whether the insurance partner says so or not because it's a safety factor. Um, do I need to get a waiver signed from someone uh, or something of that situation? Because you can't skimp on safety. You can't turn around and say, well, hey, you don't need that seat belt today. It'll be in tomorrow. Just drive the car. It's against the law to drive without seat belts. That's a safety situation. It has to be fixed. The car can't go anywhere. So it's the same thing when it comes to anything in the ADAS. It has to be done. It's billable. Um, so it needs to be put in the repair procedures. It needs to be put documented, as you said, and sometimes e even a set of photographs. If you find a sensor's in the wrong place, I, add a photograph to the file to turn around and say, hey, look, this is what we determined when we took this vehicle apart, that this is not in the right location. Or was the vehicle repaired previously? I mean, how many vehicles uh, may be in there for their second repair? And maybe someone put a core support in the wrong place. And now, as you mentioned earlier, the airbag sensor's in the wrong place. So I think every shop needs to manage these types of things as reminding themselves it's a safety factor. Um, and it is billable. Um, there's nothing worse than billing the consumer and having the consumer have to go back to their insurance company on something they didn't think was deficient or should have been approved. Off my soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> well, you bring up great points. And we, we're, as an industry, we've gotten away with a lot of stuff for a long time. And... I, and some of us have, some of us haven't. Some of us have and not even known we're getting away with it. We can't do that now. We just can't. we got to look at the entire repair. And, and I don't want to say get away, but, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, we heat it, we heat it till it dripped and pull it till it ripped for a while. And we got it within plus or minus a foot, foot and a half. And, and the <laughs> panel gaps were, were, you know, they were two feet at the time. But, you know, it's, it's a much different vehicle now. Than, than the 82 Monte Carlo, you know, and just in, just in the vehicle structure. So with that being said, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Chuck, what is coming our way that we need to be aware of in the next five years? Uh, the next five years, well, at, uh, I think we're going to see an increase in electrification. Uh, you may see uh, more... Uh, what it's subscription-based type services that are going to be entering in the vehicle, uh, like maps, entertainment, things through the infotainment system. Uh, we are going to see uh, uh, an increase in the, uh, in the night vision, like I mentioned before, and, uh, and LIDAR. And then as automation gets up to the next levels of, uh, you know, level three, level four with self-driving vehicles, uh, I would expect to see at some point that vehicle safety inspections are going to come back into play to verify that these systems are working properly. And, and uh, possibly, and I would like to see a blockchain process from the VIN number of the vehicle from birth until it's gone through the blockchain so that we know the history of that vehicle from the modifications, the previous repairs, everything that happened with a good solid record on that vehicle from beginning to end. Now, I, and, and we mentioned a couple of these technologies. Are we just talking about light vehicles 
Are we talking about medium and heavy duty as well? I believe we're talking about medium and heavy duty as well. They're talking pretty much across the board. So at, uh, and I mean, these systems are hitting the heavy duty market uh, uh, very hard right now as well with electrification and uh, ADAS system. And the liabilities are much higher in those areas as well. At, uh, and they've already done a good job of fleet management. So they've had independent fleet management now for a long time. So they pretty much know the histories of their vehicles. But this technology is coming at them very, very fast as well, you know, with the new communication technologies, the 5Gs, uh, and then uh, the anti-collision uh, uh, technologies are put, being put in these vehicles. So I'm going to throw this one out there. We keep adding more and more electronics to the vehicle, but we're still running 12 to 14 volts. <laughs> That's going to change, too. I was going to say... <laughs> Our, and, and you and I know this from some of our association meetings and different things uh, from uh, you know groups that we belong to. It seems to me that we need to move from a 12 volt, volt system to something much higher. Yeah, in, in my opinion, I think the 12 volt system is uh, sufficient for the uh, entertainment, running the comfort features of the vehicle, you know, running the uh, uh, the base systems for the programming, especially, you know, with an electric vehicle, because now you have an electric vehicle with a high voltage system that can maintain that 12 volt system uh, very, very effectively. Uh, that's on there as well. But uh, we may see that kick up to 36 if, uh, if, if we see some different types of actuators uh, being used in the vehicle that require a higher voltage. Good answer. I didn't because, you know, for years they were talking about we have to get away from 12 volts. And it's like, where does it if your processors are becoming smaller and using less power? Um, what you know, what point do we get to where are we out of space when you talk about, you know, the soccer mom with the minivan that has two DVD players in the back and, you know, all this other stuff going at the same time and it's 100 degrees out and the air conditioning's going. Um, is everything going to function correctly on the safety side? Mm -hmm. So when you start to look at how many computers are in a car today, it seems like they're running out of electric pretty quick. Yeah, huh. the, the, uh, the processing power is, uh, is getting much more condensed and uh, much more efficient okay. uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the higher speeds. And... Uh, <clears throat> Probably not, last but not least is uh, uh, the evolution of telematics. Uh, telematics is going to con continue to evolve. And telematics is not remote. Di diagnostics and telematics are two different things. But the uh, you can get some diagnostic information out of telematics. And again, if that's done properly through a blockchain, that can, can continuously feed the information of that vehicle. So when there is an issue, whether it be a breakdown, damage, or whatever, you could now have much more data that you can analyze of what led up to that for build better products and be more efficient on your repair plan. Hmm, good. Well, let's, you know, you mentioned, Tim, you mentioned power, okay, 12 volts versus 30, and in, in we talked about that for a second. And Chuck just talked about processing power and telematics, but I think we're, we're missing one key aspect, and that is the proliferation of data that is being generated within the vehicle and what is being in what is being moved around the vehicle in terms of in terms of data needs where do you see that going chuck it uh, that's got a lot of arms and legs on it there <laughs> 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 it, uh, <clears throat> it it there's going to be a lot of companies, but I think uh, uh, most of the data that the companies that the car is putting out with the telematics data has to do with location and owner behavior for advertising opportunities. Uh, that's where I see a lot of uh, a lot of that data uh, being used. The other data I think is already being ingested by OEMs to continuously improve their products uh, that is being uh, being brought in, and uh, you know for prognostics. You know, it, uh, I can see over time this system is starting to deteriorate and take action before I'm in a walk-home situation or a safety situation and uh, be proactive. So that's, uh, that's how I see a lot of that being used in the future. Oh, great answer. 
Well. <laughs> Tim, did you have anything else that you wanted to cover? No, I think we pretty much covered everything. Uh, Chuck, I want to thank you for your time today um, out of your busy schedule. I know we're hit and miss back and forth in a bunch of different meetings and flying all over the place trying to make sure everybody's <laughs> happy in the whole world. Um, but um, you brought some very interesting points uh, today, some things for our you know, our viewers to be able to look at and watch. Um if there's, you have any questions, you can forward questions off to us um, on our uh, Facebook page, Instagram. Um, you can reach us at uh, tmorgan at spinezy-americas.com. Uh, and we'll try and answer your question. Uh, if we get, we have to get with Chuck. Uh, we'll get with Chuck to be able to get you the right answer. Um, and I really, again, want to thank you very much for uh, stopping by today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And if you want to have, have additional questions for us, uh, you have Team Morgan at spinezy-americas.com. Also, media at spinezy-americas.com. And don't forget to call us at 224 224- Spinezy. That's 224-772-6374. I'd like to thank Chuck Olson from AirPro Diagnostic for coming in and, and speaking with us today. Tim Morgan uh, of Spinezy Americas. I'm Carl Kirschman. Until next time, have a great day. <laughs>